Western United States are drying up. This is the effect of 21 consecutive years of drought. Wildfires are scorching the region at unprecedented rates. A natural disaster and um, an environmental emergency like we've never seen in the American West particularly. Millions of Americans rely on a water system and supply that can't meet the demand. You know, this river is really in danger of being over allocated. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Jason Grenauer. In this special presentation, we're digging into that drought crisis across the West and its far reaching impact from our water infrastructure to our forests and our farmlands. According to July data released by the U.S. Drought Monitor, less than 1% of the land in western states was drought free, and more than 60% was experiencing extreme or exceptional drought. It's the worst drought situation ever on record. More than 60 million people west of the Rocky Mountains are experiencing drought conditions, and that's putting a strain on our water supply and increasing wildfire activity across the region. By mid-July, there were more than 130 fires burning across the West, including more than 50 uncontained large fires. More than 1.1 million acres have already burned in the western half of the United States this year. And after record fires across the West last year, officials predict those fires will increasingly burn year-round as a decades-long mega-drought worsens. Um, and then when you look at like what the, the climatologists are predicting, you know, Right now, um, in the United States, we, we burn around uh, on a bad, what we call a bad fire year, um, about 10 million acres. And by 2050, we're looking at that doubling to, you know, 20 million acres across the United States. With several western rivers already dry or running warm and low, it's likely that the federal government will, for the first time ever, declare a water shortage for the Colorado River system that supplies water to the west. And we want to give you an in-depth look at what exactly that means. 40 million Americans depend on the Colorado River and the reservoirs it populates for their drinking water, their irrigation, and their energy. Join us for a trip along the Colorado River's 1,400-mile journey through the West. It may not look like much here, but this small stream of cold water is the headwaters of the Colorado River. The water comes from a lake on Lapooter Pass in Rocky Mountain National Park and then flows south to Grand Lake and Lake Granby. It's here in Granby where much of the water gets diverted. Instead of flowing downstream, it gets pumped through a series of tunnels to homes and businesses on the eastern side of the mountains. At its core, the, this river has been called the American Nile, and it's because it's so important for the American Southwest and Mexico. Scott Braden is the wilderness and public lands advocate for Conservation Colorado. With the you know, accumulating impacts of climate change that makes our snowpack, a little more iffy and makes runoff earlier each year. You know, this river is really um, in danger of being over allocated. There is no denying that this is an impressive journey. It's the fifth longest river in the U.S. And none of it would be made possible without the snowpack from the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. In the winter, Colorado's beautiful snow covered mountains are more than just a magnet for skiers and backcountry hikers. They're a giant storage facility for water. While the water from that snowpack flows into the Colorado all along the river's course, a lot of it makes its way into the Colorado as the river heads southwest, from Granby to where we are in Glenwood Springs. From here in Glenwood, the river runs west to Grand Junction, and with this river, Grand is the name of the game. Until 1921, what we know as the Colorado River was known as the Grand River. Think about it, Grand Lake. Grand Junction, the Grand Canyon, those names are no coincidence. And once the water leaves here in Glenwood, it is then joined by the waters of the Roaring Fork. From that point, it's about 90 miles to Grand Junction and the Utah border. The Utah portion of the river's course starts on the Colorado Plateau before heading to Moab. The water sweeps by arches and Canyonlands National Parks, both amazing landscapes eroded into canyons and mesas by the Colorado and Green Rivers, which combine into one downstream. After those rivers combine, they head here, Lake Powell, the lake Good formed river. behind the enormous Glen Canyon Dam. The lake is uh, probably the largest economic generator in this part of the country. The boating and all the infrastructure to, to, boat, to support boating and recreation is uh, pretty significant. The water is used in parts of the five states that make up the upper basin of the Colorado. 
Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming, where the Green River starts before joining the Colorado. Before that water gets to the Grand Canyon, it passes a critical point, Lee's Ferry, which is just downstream from Glen Canyon Dam. Now, this is the spot where the river is divided into two basins for water rights purposes. The upper basin, which Eric just mentioned, includes parts of Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming. There's also the lower basin. That includes other parts of Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico, as well as parts of Nevada and California. Water rights laws regarding the Colorado River are as complicated as they are old. In fact, the Colorado River Compact that divides the river into these two basins was signed into law in 1922. Once the river leaves Glen Canyon and makes its way through Lee's Ferry, it begins to wind its way through the 217 mile long Grand Canyon. After the Grand Canyon, the Colorado stops here. Hoover Dam, Lake Mead, and when it's at capacity, it's one of the largest reservoirs in the nation. But as Bree Guy with KTNV found out, it was far from it. The effects of decades long drought can be seen clearly on the shores of Lake Mead. In fact, where I am standing now is a boat launch ramp that has been closed because of low water levels. Imagine a time when you could launch all the way up there. We'll hit elevation about 1071 above mean sea level, and that's the lowest the reservoir has been since it was filled back in the late 1930s. One way you can tell the water is really low is this, what park officials call a bathtub ring. A stark contrast in color, the line shows where the water used to be. Overall, the Colorado River system is down below 50% capacity. Last time Lake Mead was essentially full, was more than 20 years ago. Here at uh, Hoover Dam Lake Mead, uh, we're down to about 36% capacity. This is the effect of 21 consecutive years of drought. Hoover Dam serves water to states in the lower basin of the Colorado, which includes parts of California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Nevada, including Las Vegas. 90% of the water used in Las Vegas comes from Lake Mead, which is about an hour away from the city. Visitors, this may be hard to believe, but most of the water is used for residential areas not hotels and casinos. All the hotels here are good at conservation. Just about all the water used at hotels like the Bellagio here is captured, treated, and then reused or sent back to Lake Mead. With water levels low and more people moving to the area, conservation is on everyone's mind. I think Lake Mead will always be here. I think there isn't a chance that Lake Mead is ever going to go away. From the Hoover Dam, the Colorado River turns south and heads through the gambling town of Laughlin, Nevada, Lake Havasu, Arizona, and then onto the border town of Yuma. Across much of the western U.S., farmers depend on water from the Colorado River and others for their crops. But as water levels fall, the agencies responsible for allocating water have to cut back, forcing many farmers into tough decisions. Joe Del Bosque has farmed his family's land in Central California since 1985. This year, he chose to destroy his entire field of asparagus so that he can conserve the water for his watermelon crop, which requires more water. He says drought conditions will force farmers to either plant crops that need less water or eliminate them to save water for more profitable crops. The end result, less variety at the grocery store and an unstable job market for farm workers. It feels terrible. Um, you know, first of all, it is a producing field. Uh, it could have gone another three years. But what really hurts is at the end of the day is, you know, we had about 20 people working in this one field and we have to tell them that there's no work for them next year. Also complicating life for farmers and decision makers behind divvying up water is longer dry spells. Throughout the region, the data shows we're waiting longer in between rain events. Brian Brennan explains. University of Arizona research shows not only is rainfall down overall, but the average time between storms in the western United States has increased by about 50%. So in the 1970s, that time was about 30 days, and now it's up to 48 days. Research hydrologist Joel Biederman and his team made the conclusion after looking at data from hundreds of climate sites. The length of time between rain events can have big impacts when it comes to agriculture, flash flooding, plant life, and wildfires. If you think about what would keep a forest uh, less likely to burn, imagine that sprinkling a little water on it every, every few days or every week is probably more effective than dumping a large amount all at the beginning of the summer and then waiting a few months. Biederman says the climate trends only point to dry spells getting longer and hotter. Brian Brennan, KGA 9 on your side. 
still ahead, how a dried out region is compounding the wildfire impact in the West, and what state and federal leaders are doing to combat the problem. Plus, a look at the role of our changing climate. Welcome back to our coverage of extreme drought sweeping the western states. The effects of a hotter, drier American West are evident. 4.2 million acres burned in California in a historic wildfire season last year. 625,000 acres were charred in Colorado. And as Dan Grossman shows us, those fires are burning faster and creating a vicious cycle with forest regeneration. It's really clear now that our systems are changing and fire activity is responding very acutely to a warming climate. In the last 2,000 years, wildfires in the high Rocky Mountains of the western United States are burning nearly twice as often as before, and they're burning more often in higher elevations that have historically been more resistant to them. Over 70 percent of the total area burned since 1984 occurred last year in 2020. Phil is the man behind those numbers. This is our cold storage room. Alongside PhD candidate Kira Wolf, the professor of fire ecology at the University of Montana has been studying sediment samples to observe fire activity and how it's reaching heights, both literal and figurative, like never before. Losing all of that canopy cover um, leads to much hotter temperatures in the burned areas, even compared to adjacent forest. And so that can kind of exacerbate that drought stress for seedlings. Kira just alluded to the drought from hotter temperatures, and researchers are in agreement it is directly tied to climate change. Four of California's five largest fires ever burned last year, and the three largest in Colorado's history burned last year as well. After millions of years of fire activity in alpine forests such as these, trees started to adapt by developing pine cones on their branches. At a certain temperature during a fire, they'll burst and drop their seeds into the ground, which will then grow into budding trees as a way to regenerate the forest. The concern is with this increased fire activity that we're seeing, new fires will burn these baby pine trees before they've had time to produce these cones, potentially wiping out forests down the road. There's a lot of evidence that tree regeneration after fires is declining because of these stressful post-fire conditions. I'm Dan Grossman. The fire situation has become so dire, lawmakers across the West have formed a Congressional Wildfire Caucus to combat the growing problem. In a July meeting, that group, comprised of representatives from six Western states, shared its priorities in the fight against the fires, from personnel to funding. Megan Lopez explains. In a press call this week, Congressman Joe Nagu said it starts with changing our mentality. It's no longer wildfire seasons, but wildfire years, and they need to be treated as such. Now, that could mean changing that seasonal firefighter approach to either extend the season or to make those positions year round. Firefighter pay, also a big topic of discussion. Last month, President Joe Biden called $13 an hour minimum wage for federal firefighters ridiculous and vowed to use bonuses and incentives to boost that pay to at least $15 an hour. Hour. But that's only for this year, so it will take Congress to make those pay changes permanent. Meanwhile, Congressman John Garmendi said that reforming how the U.S. Forest Service is funded is another big issue. Before, the Forest Service had only one firefighting account, but all the money was used on suppression and nothing was left over for forest management. Now there are two separate accounts for fighting fires and mitigating them. The lawmakers also talked at length about taking a regional approach and having states help one another instead of fighting for resources like tankers. They also discussed using equipment that wasn't necessarily made for fires to help fight them, including different aircrafts. But the bottom line from all of these Congress members of this caucus is that wildfires are becoming more serious by the year, and it's going to take more funding and a new approach to deal with them. In Jefferson County, Colorado, I'm Megan Lopez reporting. In California, officials hope one solution to mitigate the damage done by fires is technology. Meteorologist Leah Pazetti explains the complex network of cameras aimed at containing fires early. 
Copter 11 Monta Vista. Inside Cal Fire's command center. This is where we take in all the 911 calls. Response is the number one priority. Engine 3387 Monta Vista copies 1053. And when there's report of a fire, these fire captains turn their eyes oh. to the sky. Here's where we access all the cameras. The alert wildfire system has 850 cameras across California and more in surrounding states, giving fire crews an instantaneous look at potential flames as soon as they get a call. One of us will get on this cameras and start looking around in that geographic area for if there is any smoke showing. So we'll get the location on the CAD, which will show us what direction off of Mount Woodson it might be. And then we can go down here and position that camera in that same direction. If the fire looks large, they can then immediately determine if they need to send a larger response rather than waiting until the first crews arrive. It makes a big difference to be able to see and know that something's actually there you know, instead of waiting for them to get on scene. This is a relatively new tool. These cameras started about five years ago, and it all started with a group of colleges. Students are involved, engineers, professors. So it, it's it's been born out of the universities. UC San Diego, the University of Nevada, Reno, and the University of Oregon developed and created this system. I can move the camera. Professor Neil Driscoll was there from the beginning. It really increases the response time for both ignition, for early suppression. He says at night, infrared cameras can see 110 miles in the distance. And on a clear day, cameras can see 70 miles in the distance, giving fire crews a bird's eye view at all times of the day. It's really the modern day fire tower. And these cameras are not the only new technologies helping fight fires. Every pulse is an hour. Suzanne Leininger is one of two dozen people now working with Cal Fire headquarters across the state to fill a brand new job, creating time lapsed maps of what fires could turn into if they're not tackled quickly. It comes down to you know, fuels and weather and topography. Within minutes of sparking, she uses the weather forecast and vegetation data with a new software to predict what a fire could turn into in the next one or 40 hours and tells you exactly who and what might be affected if the fire takes that route. And it gives you impacts on population, impacts on buildings, and the acreage that will burn each hour in accumulated acreage. Helping firefighters quickly determine evacuations and create a plan of attack. But this is just, you know, intel that gives them a good idea of what is in the way potentially if this doesn't get stopped. This intel plus these cameras are technologies helping firefighters have the upper hand as fire season looms. If we can train our youth to be technologically advanced, that's going to make our whole society uh, able to conquer some of these problems. And we can. We can conquer them. Leah Pizzetti, ABC 10 News. Still ahead, the climate change connection, how the drought is tied to a warming planet, and just how much of America's infrastructure is in harm's way. Welcome back to this special in-depth presentation on the Western drought crisis. We've discussed a dehydrated region in the midst of a water emergency and the heightened wildfire risk that accompanies that emergency. But what's causing all this? That's the big question. Well, the world has been giving us that answer for decades. Meteorologist Mike Nelson explains the climate connection. Temperatures have been hot across the West and precipitation has been sparse. And boy, has that really taken a toll on Lake Powell. Look at this right below the Glen Canyon Dam. From last year to this year, Lake Powell has dropped about 30 feet give you another view of that. There are a couple of boats off into the foreground here. You can see the, the bathtub ring, if you will, as that massive reservoir has not had much inflow and the outflow is dropping that water level terribly. From August of 2020 to July of 2021, again, a drop of about 30 feet at Lake Powell. And I don't have a lot of great news as far as the drought index across the western United States. The areas that you see highlighted in the dark red, that's the worst of the drought. And of course, Lake Powell is right in that location, along with Lake Mead. In Colorado, we've been generally drought free on the eastern side of the state, but exceptional to severe drought conditions over the west. And that extends all the way out into California. And looking ahead, the extended forecast for the next three months is not encouraging. Warmer than average conditions all across the west and drier than average from the northern Rockies all the way down through Colorado. All of the wet weather is holding farther to the east. 
This is not just weather. There is a climate change connection with what we're seeing. And as the world gets warmer, we do expect to have a continuation of the record setting wildfires, the heat waves and the droughts, increased tropical activity. We've already seen that so far this summer season and the shrinking Arctic ice, which is in many areas at record low levels and the thinning of the ice near the North Pole is also quite alarming. Global temperatures have been rising over the last 140 years. The world is getting warmer. It was briefly cooler than average a little bit before World War I. We had that 1930s spike, but then the clear trend, especially in the last 20 to 30 years, is a warming trend. And if you look at the hottest years on record globally, top 10 hottest years have all been since 2005. Now the weather records go back into the 1800s, but by proxy, in other words, ice cores, tree rings, sediments, and lake beds, we can actually take this back for centuries to see that the world is seeing an unprecedented warming. And with that warming, it gets hotter and drier. Hotter and drier equals more big wildfires. There are other aspects that do play into it, certainly forestry practices that have been misguided over the past century or so. But the fact of the matter is, it's getting hotter, it's getting drier, and we're seeing fires at higher levels into the mountains than we would typically experience. The cause is us. It is the increase in carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. And you can think about each molecule of carbon dioxide like a feather in a down comforter, and that's redirecting or re-radiating the heat back down rather than letting it escape into outer space. So it's acting like a blanket, allowing the Earth to warm up. Carbon dioxide, by the way, stays in the atmosphere for centuries. As a matter of fact, the carbon dioxide from the first Model T automobile is still in the atmosphere acting like a blanket causing the world to warm. A new study shows that we may not be getting out of our own way when it comes to climate change. As the West grows in population, much of that growth is also coming in places in harm's way of wildfires and other natural disasters. Research from Earth Lab shows a majority of structures are in hot spots ripe for those disasters, and growth rates in those areas are exceeding the national trend. Meanwhile, experts say the frequency of natural disasters is only increasing and costing more to the tune of over $45 billion a year. And experts say that means it's important for people in the West to not only be informed on where they are developing land, but for natural disasters to be a part of that planning process as well. So we have to prepare for a world where this is more normal. I think it actually helps uh, local and regional planners to, to, to think about how they might reframe some of the questions they've always been asking uh, when they've been developing in, in hazardous zones. So what can we do about all this? While solving the climate crisis isn't an individual task, there are steps we can take to slow the effects and to mitigate the damage. Welcome back. No single one of you watching right now can solve the massive drought problem in the western U.S. But there are some things each one of us can do to mitigate the damage done. One may sound simple, managing our water usage. Many communities in the western U.S. restrict the use of water in times of drought, but not all water usage is equal. Water that goes down a drain can be retreated and recycled through water systems. But there's no way to capture water that's used on lawns or gardens. The reason why we're such a, like sticklers, if you will, for the um, outside use of grass is because we can't reuse it. Once it comes out of your irrigation line, we're never seeing it again. To get the most of your sprinklers and not waste water, make sure you adjust your sprinkler heads to not spray beyond your yard. Eliminate any non-essential grasses on your property and keep up on system maintenance. And while we can't do much to fireproof existing homes, developers may soon have a new tool to keep their buildings standing. Researchers at the University of California, Davis, have been researching building materials that can withstand the intense heat of wildfires. They found that earth bricks are much more resistant to burning than traditional wood. Earth bricks are simply damp soil that has been compressed into bricks. For developers, the best part of the idea is the price. And it's very affordable because it's dirt, uh, it's free. Researchers say earth bricks have been used by Native Americans in Colorado for generations to make cliff dwellings. 
And wildfires need dry vegetation in order to fuel the flames. And that's why removing large areas of it is one of the best ways to defend your home. Firefighters call this defensible space, and the more of it there is, the easier their job is. There are many ways to create defensible space, like mowing tall grasses or applying herbicides. Or you can just open up a goat buffet. California-based Living Systems Management uses 500 goats to eat away grasses and brush. A single 100-pound goat can eat up to 12 pounds of brush each day. They're not only environmentally friendly, but efficient as well. The fire break that the goats leave is much better than uh, mowing or using herbicides. Firefighters use a similar technique to slow flames, but instead of hungry goats, they use controlled burns to remove wildfire fuels. Widespread drought and fire activity is also forcing some western states to reevaluate how we get our power. Wildfires jeopardize electricity imported from the Pacific Northwest, and drought puts a strain on hydropower across the region. That has officials in California considering a unique solution for wind energy, floating wind farms. It's a concept being tested out in Europe and Asia. Instead of building wind turbines that are based on the ocean floor, it would involve turbines on a platform that's then anchored to the seabed by chains or ropes. According to the Associated Press, these floating platforms could produce upwards of 10 megawatts of power, about in line with other offshore turbines, and significantly more than what's produced by turbines on land. We want to thank you so much for watching this special presentation on the Western Drought Crisis. If you want to learn more about drought conditions in your state or even in your county, you can find it on the U.S. Drought Monitor website. Climate resources are also available from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Center for Environmental Information. Thanks for watching again. I'm Jason Grenow.